This is a production of Cornell University. Um, thank you all for coming, and I hope that when you leave after this seminar, you'll know everything you wanted to know about NUA, and you'll be charged to build models and tools for growers and communities, et cetera, that use weather to tell them what they should be doing. So what is NUA? NUA is a crowdsourced network. Oh, I gotta, I'm starting my timer so I don't keep you guys too awfully long. Isn't that, isn't that terrible? I started a stopwatch instead. Okay, here we go. All right. That doesn't seem right. Okay, I'm canceling that and I'm going to use the ancient technology that's hanging <laughs> on the wall. At least it's not a solar, you know, one of those things we need to be out in the sun so I can see where the shade was. Anyway, so NUA is a crowdsourced network. Weather station owners are sharing their data through the network and providing us with feedback and guidance on how we can improve the network and how we can grow. The weather data currently is collected every 15 minutes and it is tabulated in hourly and daily summaries. We're collecting precipitation, temperature, relative humidity, leaf wetness, solar radiation, wind speed, and wind direction. And the weather stations in the network have now optional so, uh, soil temperature and moisture sensors available that the grower can install. We designate sister stations in the network so that we can avoid having gaps in the data. If you're accumulating degree days over the year and you have gaps in your data, your data is garbage. You're not gonna have a good accumulation of degree days. So it's really important not to have missing data. So basically all of this data is used to build decision support tools for IPM and crop production. And that's what I'll be talking about today. A little bit more boring history stuff for you before we get into the meat of the talk. NUA was created in 1996 by Kurt Petzold, who at the time was the vegetable IPM coordinator with the New York State IPM program. He had gotten, believe it or not, a telecommunications grant. So we set up phone lines and modems all across New York to gather weather data. Yeah, right, what's a phone? This is a phone. So initially it was an association with membership levels. Today it's open access and we have land grant and grower member support. We started out with Campbell instruments and sensor instruments, Sensatronics, Bot sensor, those became obsolete. Today we use primarily Rainwise Incorporated weather stations, although we can ingest data from onset instruments, airports, and state residents. So uh, I already talked about the man manual download. Yep, we used to go out with the computer, the laptop computer, and download. We faxed the data out. Messages were created and posted on CODA phones, and the growers could call those phones and get that message as to what the prediction was for the particular day or week or what have you. Today, we have 428 weather station locations in 23 states that are ingested into NUA. We have 10 member states plus individual members in five other states. I gave a seminar on NUA a month ago, and there were 415 weather stations. So 13 more just in the last month. This is a home, the NUA homepage. I don't expect you to be able to read this, but I just wanted to point out some things. Um, this is not the pointer. Oh my gosh, out of sight. The pointer is not working. I'm going to use the cursor. OK, so this is the website for NUA. This blue menu up here follows you throughout the website, giving you access to weather data, pest forecasts, crop management info, etc. And up here, I kind of like this. This is a little National Weather Service query box. So you can enter your city, state here, press go, and find out what the weather forecast is from the National Weather Service. And now, given where we are with the internet, the map saves your location. Ooh, it knows where you are. So that can be really creepy for some of us who are old school. But 
It's exciting for those of you who like using the web and having it seamlessly remember where you are. So that is not how I advance the slide. This is how I advance the slide. So the NOAA station pages, Gillian, if I'm good? Okay. All right. The NOAA station pages look like this. So this is the Ashwood weather station page. It provides quick links to test forecasts here, some weather products here, quick, quick links. This actually has been upgraded. You know, a lot of these screenshots, if you go now, they're not going to be exactly the same because as with any web technology, we're changing it all the time and updating it all the time. So you can access location-specific data here. This happens to be a weather station that belongs to an apple grower. And typically the apple growers will link, you know, they'll bookmark this page so that they can get to the models easily. This is the NUA map. The states that are colored purple are member states. They pay an annual fee. And those that are orange have just individual growers that are plugged into NUA that are paying a, a smaller fee. And then the larger Google map shows the icons that are the NUA stations and then the National Weather Service airport locations. So how does NUA benefit the programs of plant pathology and plant microbiology? Well, certainly plant disease forecast models can be developed into tools to inform management decisions. IPM is all about reducing the pesticide footprint in crops and You'll see, as I get through this talk, how much of an impact this system has on that. Weather data can be used to validate and implement plant disease epidemiology models, or potentially some research that you're doing on a plant disease epidemic. In addition, data in NUA can be used for pathosystem research and development. So if you're just doing some research out in the field and there's a weather station close by, you can correlate some of those weather events to disease development. So I'm here today and I'm giving I'm giving make sure I don't blind myself. I'm giving this talk for the third time, no, for the fourth time I'm going to say I'm giving this talk. To stimulate thinking about developing and utilizing NUA to benefit agriculture and communities. And to raise awareness of what NUA has to offer. Some of you have the dubious distinction, Magdalene of having seen my seminar that I gave for Soil and Crop Sciences. I gave a seminar for entomology last month, and next month, should you choose to see what we have to offer for horticulture, I'll be giving this talk in horticulture. Okay, now I have a plethora of devices up here. All right, so now we're gonna go through some of these predictive tools. They fall into basically three categories. Crop management tools, weather products, and pest forecast tools. All of these tools are in real time, they're query-based, decision support. They have, some of them have built-in biofixes. A biofix could be first trap catch date, uh, coddling moth, for coddling moth uh, management in an apple orchard. It could be emergence date for potatoes, for uh, understanding when to spray for late blight or early blight, to know when that crop is emerging. Um, but I don't think we have a built-in biofix for that one. And they all have an interactive user interface. So the crop management tools, I'm not going to dwell on here, but primarily they are, this is the drop-down list on NUA for these, and again, this changes depending on what we've got to offer. Um, but primarily, crop load management, irrigation, and freeze risk are the three key areas that people are interested in utilizing weather data for. Weather products. So we have, again, this is the drop down list from the website. We have all these degree days for these base temperatures. These are based on the models that we currently have. So if we're already calculating the base temperature, we just basically use that and calculate that and show the tabulated uh, degree days for that base temperature. And they're tabulated starting from four different dates January 1, obvious calendar date. March 1, apple growers like that. April 1, and May 1. I think April 1, grape growers like that. So we have hourly data tables, daily summary tables, and a degree day calculator.
calculator, yay, which we just resurrected this year. So I have to share this with you. I'm really excited about getting this back online. It went offline when we migrated to a new website. So basically, you can select the degree date type, accumulation start date, end date, hit get report. Obviously, you need to select the state and the weather station location. And the results show up here. This graph is initially hidden, but you can hit a button and it pops open. And if you scroll along, there's a little pop-up box that tells you, essentially, the point at which you're looking. Um, gives a forecast of five days, past two days, and the current. So this is the degree day accumulation each day. Oh yeah, it got cold in September. But it's warm this week, yes. Go climate warming. No, sorry, I'm not a fan. <laughs> and then there, obviously, is a seasonal accumulation. So this I'm going to show you because this is what growers can use. These are the hourly and daily data summaries. And this basically is showing what we're now calling the Valentine's Day Massacre. So last winter was really mild, right? It was just really bizarrely mild. But then what happened was around Valentine's Day, the temperature plummeted. And you can see it got as low as minus 10 here. And then this is the daily data summary. So you can see here's the 14th and the 15th. So that's why the sweet cherry crop was pretty much toast in New York. There weren't any peaches to speak of. Apricots were toast. So those of you who are fans of nectarines and peaches, like I am, mm, it was a real bummer because we really didn't have very many of those. So now I'm going to talk about the things that are near and dear to our hearts. And these are the pest forecast tools for plant diseases. And I found out yesterday that we have two <coughs> more plant disease tools than I thought because, well, I'll get into that later. So I used to say 14, but I got to put 16 on the slide yesterday. So I'm going to walk through the apple scab model. I'm a fruit person, and so most of what I know about is fruit. So essentially, what you're going to do, as I mentioned with the uh, degree day calculator, you're going to select a disease on the apple disease models, a state. This screenshot happens to be before we put the state drop down in this tool. You'd select a weather station. This happened to be in <coughs> Minnesota. I was giving a talk in Minnesota. And the date of interest, April 29th. And you hit calculate. Initially, this map tab is showing, and it has a Google map. And once you hit calculate, you get the little dots of wheels going, and the results show up. So at the top, you can see that you, there's a green tip date. We are estimating this green tip date, and it's Macintosh green tip date, from over 20 years of historical observations at the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station at Geneva. So we've been looking at apple phenology and insect data for years and years up there. So we can estimate, and we also had weather data. So we can estimate that green tip date, or you can overwrite it. So you can enter your 50% green tip of Macintosh date here, and the model will recalculate. So initially at the top, there are the ASCA score maturity summary, ASCA scores over winter in the leaf litter in the orchard, and they mature in the spring. And we need at least 11 to 12% mature assay for spore ejection to, likely, to be likely to occur. So we know that. We know this from a lot of work that's been done on apple scab. And here you can see the apple scab ASCA score maturity model is showing what um, the accumulation is for this time frame. Again, two past dates, a current date, and the five-day forecast here. So it looks like, oh yeah, we're going to be, you know, we're, we're in the apple scab season here, folks. You can click on this, and it'll show you the apple ascospore maturity chart. So here's the chart for ascospore maturity. Obviously, if it was April 1, it wouldn't show uh, all of this. It would just show a portion of it. But this, <coughs> sorry, I think April 1 was the green tip date. I take that back. So um, let's go back so that I can 
not confuse everybody. So this was, the date of interest was April 29. And so this is the assets for maturity chart for that date. And down here, this shows the temperature in blue, the precip in green, and then the forecast data is in a different color, brown and yellow. Below the ASCUS for maturity chart are the apples cab infection events. These are calculated based on rainfall and temperature during that rain or leaf wetting event. And basically the chart's gonna be green or red depending on whether there is an event. I was accessing this historically and that's why the days to symptoms haven't calculated here because the forecast details at that point in time weren't being saved and they couldn't populate this chart. But below, the management information is below here and it's included here and you can click here for a pesticide selection tool that is housed on another website and as the growing season progresses, this will change and the model goes dormant from October 1st to March 1st. If this says a combined event up here, you can click down here at the apple scab infection events and you'll get the details of what went into deciding to combine two wedding events into a single wedding event to determine infection risk. And this is basically the leaf wetness events log. 2015 was a really wet year, um, obviously in Minnesota as well as here in New York. Next I'm going to share the fire blight model. Uh, fire blight risk, I think probably this model and the apple scab model are the two top use models by apple growers. Fire blight is a bacterial disease that can kill trees outright. It kills limbs, it enters the blossoms. The model is modeling blossom blight as opposed to shoot blight. So we want to know when the first blossom open date is, and again, historically calculated, or you can enter it yourself. And then you can say what the blight history is in your orchard here. This model is based on the Cougar blight model from Washington State University. When you hit calculate, these are the results that you'll get. So you can see for the dates I chose, there was low risk in the past, but currently there's high risk going into the future, but then it's getting cooler again, and the risk drops off. This information defines the risk levels, and then there's more to this model below. And essentially what you can do is you can enter the date that you applied streptomycin, which is an antibiotic registered for use against uh, fire blight. And once you enter that date, you will recalculate the risk. So if I apply strep on May 11, you can see that the risk has dropped now to much lower. So the rest of these, I'm just gonna give you some screenshots of the rest of these models that we have on NUA. We have a grape disease infection events uh, model for Fomopsis, powdery mildew, and black rot. There's also a downy mildew simulation model built by years of research by Roger Pearson, Bob Seam, and David Benori up in Geneva. It's called DMCAST. I don't have a screenshot of that, um, but there's that model as well. So you can see in the past there really was no risk, but it looks like in the future forecast things could get dicey. And then there's disease management information down here, and the page obviously is longer than that. The tomato disease forecast, which was just recently revised by Abby Seaman, who's the vegetable IPM coordinator, is shown here. So this is a screenshot. Here you can see you've entered the information on this side, as I mentioned before, get report, and then this is the report that shows up. So this is where I got the two additional diseases, because I didn't realize Tomcast was also being used to uh, predict septoria blight and anthracnose on tomatoes, so that was kind of exciting. So this shows the results for TomCast, as well as late light SimCast, and then there's a key giving information about what these things mean. There's also a late light app that Bill Fry's program developed called Blight Pro DSS, DSS stands for 
stands for Decision Support System. And there's a link to that on NUA, so that if you wanted to download that now, you could have it. The potato disease forecast, very similar, except the early blight model is different. It's calculating P days. Here's the P day key. And then here's the late blight uh, blight pass severity. Onion disease model was recently revised. These were all separate. Now they're all on one page. So we've got the Botrytis leaf blight model, downy mildew, and purple blotch here, as well as the keys that tell you uh, what all of this means. So what is NUA and how is it growing? Now I'm going to talk about sort of the inner workings of NUA. We started partnering with the Northeast Regional Climate Center in probably 2007, 2009, and they now house our climate database. They help us with model programming into the PI design tools that, that I just gave you some just snapshots of. They help us with data quality control, provide meteorological expertise and guidance. And the nice thing is, is that they're interested in agricultural applications for climate data. And they helped us develop automated reports so that if a weather station isn't reporting, an automated message goes to that owner and they know then that their weather station is reporting. And that has been really well received. Um, I was surprised, I thought people would be kind of ticked off, uh, but quite, quite the opposite actually. This is an example of one of the tools that the Northeast Regional Climate Center themselves create. This is Stewart's wilt disease for corn, and this shows the risk of the bacteria having overwintered in the flea beetle that vectors the disease. So if the temperatures in the winter are really, really cold, then the bacterium is killed in the flea beetle. So um, they've done that, and then there are also some tools that they have on their site. So we link to their tools, and they also link to us. So we have this cross-linkage thing going on. So here's a shot of what the weather station looks like. This complete with cables, software, everything is a little under $2,000. And this is the page on the NUAA website that tells the grower how to buy a weather instrument and get it connected in. We also have done some work on maintenance and troubleshooting guidelines. One thing I will point out is that these are no longer configured with the leak wetness sensor on the south side. These are all solar powered. So this leak wetness sensor is now attached to the rain bucket on the north side at a 45 degree angle. RainWise has helped us with file transfer protocol software to get our data into our database. They now, most of our stations are connected with what they call the IP100, so it is automatically beamed via the internet to their website, RainWise.net, and then we scrape the data off their website into our system. Uh, this fall, we're going to be developing an API so that we can start ingesting one-minute data. Growers want one-minute data. Rainwise wants to deliver one-minute data. Why? Because they have some tools and products that they themselves have developed, frost alarms and things like that, that they would like to be able to market to their clientele. And they've also helped us develop different products. So this is the exciting thing. Okay, the weather station numbers have really grown. Um, I became lead of NUA in 2005 and got a few grants to just nominally increase the network into eastern New York. It was primarily rich in the central New York area. And then um, things got really popular and people started buying and installing the instruments in New York. Um, as of 2016, we have all of these states that are full state members. This green bar here is New Jersey because New Jersey, the state climatology office joined and wrote programming to deliver their entire climatology mesonet of data into our system, which was really fantastic. We grew by almost 40 weather instruments within a week. So that was pretty exciting. The other thing is that in 2010, essentially the plug was pulled on agricultural IPM funding for New York State. And I got my letter saying that I wasn't going to have a job in six months. 
and we were all kind of bummed out in IPM. And at that time, for the 2011 fiscal year, and you can see it, it's the blue bar drops here. Um, for the 2011 fiscal year, no funding at all was uh, reinstated for New York at all. And I was faced with a $5,000 phone bill. So every single modem connected weather instrument was eliminated, and growers were given the option to purchase a rainwise instrument. So that had a huge impact, but at the same time, Massachusetts and Vermont were interested in joining NUA. And so it was like the perfect scenario. So I said, okay, you can join, but you have to pay a fee. And so thus was born fiscal irresponsibility in NUA and among all of us. But it has since created almost a nightmare of growth to the point where, although I'm only supposed to be devoting 5 to 10% of my time on NUA, <clears throat> I'm devoting a little bit more than that, as you can well imagine. And we are now going to be hiring a NUA coordinator in IPM. So we were successful in getting a grant to fund that position. And our Ag IPM funding this year was reinstated to the 2010 so that was really exciting too, and it helped, helped us immensely. So this is just to give you all the logo. So do you have, I know we're moving away from printed and into more hieroglyphic communication in our sort of language base. So these are all our current partners. And the thing that's really exciting is that the state of Minnesota and the state of North Carolina are full members because of the Apple River associations in those states. And probably the biggest driver is the Apple crop load management tool, the Apple carbohydrate thinning model. It has revolutionized apple thinning. The new partners up and coming. So I've been talking with the state climatology offices in North Carolina and Delaware. And the exciting thing is EnviroWeather started collaborating with us this year. We're just putting the finishing touches on programming the ingestion of their data from their state climatology network. But they also have a NUA type system, and they have models that could benefit us as well as the models that we have. They mostly want the Apple thinning model. And then there's a New York State mesonet that's being constructed right now across New York, funded by FEMA after Sandy and Irene devastated the Hudson Valley, Long Island, and New York City. So we are going are embarking on talks with them to see whether we can get their data. The Climate Smart Farming Group, Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions, is developing some tools for climate, and I'm excited about what they are going to be developing, because then that's something else I can link to on NUA, and it provides an additional benefit to our users. And this fall, we'll be talking with Glenn Kaler at the University of Maine to see about getting ag radar models that he has for apples embedded into New York. Our stakeholder priorities, obviously the top one is sustainable funding, responsive web design, more station locations via the use of the National Digital Forecast Database, which has about a one kilometer resolution, um, more apps, alerts, Many growers want to be able to save their green tip date or to save that seeding date or whatever it is that they are putting in as an input for their biofix. They'd like NUA to save that. We aren't set up to do that yet. We'd love to be able to do that. Uh, station maintenance, troubleshooting, promoting awareness. So that's why I'm here. We had a planning meeting among all of our uh, members and out of that came four objectives. We definitely want a responsive web design. I mean, NUA does work okay on a smartphone. There are some platforms that, it, that some of the map products don't work. Um, so we definitely need this. NUA premium products would allow us to charge potentially a subscription fee. If we were to develop an end user cache and have a premium side to NUA, we may be able to have a subscription and thus improve our funding base and eliminate the need for the yearly fees that are paid by the land grant institutions. Um, the virtual stations, 
That was third. And then the fourth objective we talked about was to create a developer sandbox. This would essentially be behind the scenes where the researcher, developer could go in, they could create a tool, see if it's working, validate it, and then if it's working well, they could implement it. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yes, Julie. You're all thinking. So what kind of data, I mean weather data research have we been up to? We did create a leaf wetness estimator. We had to have that for airport locations. They don't have leaf wetness sensors. And we did a little bit of work on this. There's more work that needs to be done on that, but we are estimating leaf wetness for any hour with relative humidity above 90. We're counting that as a wet hour. We haven't gotten any complaints yet. We are using, oh, and I should say, that the airport relative humidity is error corrected because it's surrounded by tarmac and the bi you know the the it's not biome but the microclimate there is vastly different from <laughs> an agricultural setting. Um, we are looking at data quality control for precipitation. Our data at the Climate Center is working on this, and then. Uh, Keith Eggleston, who works with the Climate Center, looks at the solar radiation data periodically and eliminates stations with bad solar radiation data from the Apple Thinning tool. And then we're going to be looking at temperature and humidity. We've got a grant for that. Um, it would be really great to be able to do research to compare that National Digital Forecast database with our on-the-ground stations and vice versa. There, that's The meteorologists and climatologists tell me that's a, a really uh, fertile ground in research. And then uh, right now they're looking at uh, soil temperature estimates compared to actual soil sensors that are being placed in the ground. So our Autonomous group developed a soil temperature estimate map for us that we are planning to implement in a weed germination model down the line. Currently um, funded we have developed a San Jose scale model for apples. That's new this year. Art and Yellow developed that with the Apple Research and Development Program. Uh, Kara Cox and I are looking to incorporate the epiphytic infection potential from Mary Blight into the Apple Fire Blight tool. Mary Blight is a copyrighted model. It's freely available online, but we can't just incorporate it into NOAA because it's copyrighted. Um, and Alan Biggs at the University of Maryland has been working with Carrick on that. Betsy Lamb in IPM got a grant from the New York Farm Viability Institute to develop woody ornamental insect reading tools, and the Christmas tree growers are really jazzed about this. Greg Loeb, Carrick Cox, and I got some funding from the New York Berry Growers Association to develop berry insect and disease models, so we'll be embarking on that this year. And Anamique Schilder, has an SCRI planning grant. She is an alum here from Cornell. She is a faculty member at Michigan State University. And this will be on blueberry fruit rots. But there's a wish list of over 40 models. I mean, there, there's just, you know, as many research, you guys are doing all this great work, we're going to try to implement it so the growers benefit. So what are the impacts and outcomes? So NUA is transforming weather knowledge into tools. Farmers are sharing their weather data resources through cloud computing. And the forecasts are pushing the results out five days. We can probably go, we could probably go a week, and the meteorologists wouldn't get too nervous. And that makes these actually disease forecast models. Because they were always called disease forecast models, but we only had weather data to say, oh, too bad, you had an apple scab infection event two days ago. Well, you can't do anything about that now. So, so that's kind of exciting to be able to you know, forecast this stuff out. So some anecdotes from growers that I've heard. I use the newest site almost every day early in the season. The second one was a little more denigrating towards a system that had previously been used, but the person was saying the orchard was scab-free for the first time in several years, and the orchard manager had relied heavily on NUA. And uh, Wynn Cowgill 
from Rutgers said that two New Jersey apple growers reported the best thinning results ever in 2015 using NUA's apple thinning tool. So I guess I would say that NUA promotes better IPM, reduced pesticide use, and improved environmental protection. Better crop management, improved crop quality, and improved yield. And certainly enhanced decision support. In 2007, before we launched the website I just showed you, we launched that website in 2009. It's like geriatric now. It's really geriatric. But in 2007, when we surveyed growers about the impact of NUA on IPM, you can see that the vast majority agreed or strongly agreed that NUA helps reduce sprays, improve spray timing, alert of pest risk, and enhance IPM. Growers in that survey reported that they would save, on average, $19,500 per year in spray costs and prevent a quarter of a million dollars per year in crop loss. And these are high-value horticultural crops, so these are primarily apple growers, grape growers, and a few onion and potato growers that were responding to this survey back in 2007. Our audience is much larger and broader now, obviously. And this piece, I didn't believe it. I went over these web stats, I think probably four times. But we are experiencing over two million page views per year. A page view is when somebody spends at least 30 minutes on your web page. Okay, it's not just a click and I'm gone. It's not a hit. This is a page view. So NUA is access to IPM decision support. And IPM is all about sustainable management of pests using methods that minimize environmental, health, and economic risks. We're using plant disease epidemiology, insect phenology, plant phenology, and crop management information and in creating phenological models and forecasts. We are doing pretty good in fruit and vegetables. We could do a lot better in ornamentals and field crops and even livestock. NUA is open access, real-time, prairie-based decision support with built-in biofix and an interactive user interface. We've got 40 tools on our wish list. We want more station locations, an end-user cache, alarms, better data quality control and support, and a developer sandbox. And with that, I'll thank you and open it up for questions. So I have two questions. Um, the first is, would you describe that the populations of station owners consist of growers and airports, or is there another population? Okay, yeah, so I had that slide, I took it out. So the people who own weather stations include growers. They include land-grant universities. So the Connecticut, University of Connecticut Mesonet that's connected to NUA, all their rainwise instruments are owned by UConn. So some land-grant universities decide they're going to grant fund their entire mesonet and plug it in. But they do it typically on farms, so that makes sense. Connecticut wanted one in every county, so they did that, and I think those are on schools or above turf grass, so lawns and that type of thing. There is a, a rainwise connected instrument at the Arnold Arboretum, Harvard University's Botanical Garden. There is a weather station in the Adirondacks that's really associated with a natural area, but the person who installed it wanted degree days because they do research on insects and insect phenology. Um, there are the state mesonets. So Rutgers mesonet, they have, I think, three different styles of weather instruments plugged in to their mesonet. And so that that's another, another group. But by and large, we try to uh, ask the growers. Recently, we had Champlain Valley Agronomics join us. They have 22 rainwise instruments in the Adirondacks in the Champlain Valley, primarily on dairy farms. And they use the data because concentrate, confined, careful, confined animal feeding operations cannot spread manure unless they have a record of the weather before and after they spread that manure. And so that report was essential 
And, and this guy knows a lot about brainwise instruments, so it's, it's kind of exciting. mentioned uh, a figure of five predicted days, uh, a generalization that I took. Right. Uh, that means that the biology of the pathogen is set to infect, if I can put it that way, during that five-day period, the way that previously has set that up. Is that correct? Depends on the model. Well, okay, let me go Obviously, further. right? Because I was after the fact that I did not hear in, in the presentation uh, the role of incoming weather plays in terms of the development of that disease once everything else is in line for disease to occur. Right, right. So predominantly, or for the most part, the models are predicting an infection event. So it's getting into the plant. But what about symptom development? Is that what you're talking about? What about the infection process and the development of symptoms? Well, the, wet, the incoming and weather the, is going to trigger the disease once you have all those other uh, things lined up. lined up on a four-day, uh, five-day period. Right. So depending on the model, the things that may be lining up could be hourly data. So the model may need hourly data. Some, Most of the insect models only need daily data. They only need the max and the min. And the, so the weather, there are only, I think, two instances where we're looking at development of disease and disease symptoms. One is for apple scab and the other is for fire blight. I don't think I'm answering your question, Jim. I'm but sorry. From a, I'd just like to make this point. From a goer oh. standpoint, okay. if you've got that information that the disease can occur during this five-day period based upon the forecast, then I, as a grower, would be paying real attention to the incoming weather. And that's going to make a big difference whether I'm going to apply a sprayer. Absolutely. Absolutely. It so, does. So, so the grower has got to play a role in this in terms of making that, that spray decision based upon what he gets from other sources. Yes, absolutely. That's a really very good point because all of this is just what the grower sees. And ultimately, it's the grower that's going to make the decision. So some apple farms have gotten so large that they can't cover in one day. Their sprayers cost a quarter of a million dollars, you know, and they may only have one, but they need five days to cover their orchard. So then, well, that's where the size of the operation yeah. makes a big difference. So there are all kinds of things that weigh in on a grower's decision making. Okay. Yes. Can you measure the economic impact of this program systematically? We measure. I'm sorry, okay, the question is, did we measure the economic impact of this program in a systematic way? Um, not being an economist or, um, what I did was I developed questions for the survey that basically were asking the respondents to fill in how much it was saving them in sprays, how much it was saving them estimated in crop loss. I'd have to go back to that 2007 survey to see exactly how those were worded. Uh, is your wish list public? So like if a developer is looking for a project and they go, well, what a great idea. <laughs> it will be now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I have, um, I am so looking forward to having a new accord so that they can get this wish list and figure it out. And, yeah. Okay. I was kind of curious about the business end of things. I'm assuming that this is incorporated as a not-for-profit under Cornell's banner. And in that realm, I wondered about issues. Okay. <laughs> but I wondered about issues of intellectual property and, and even liability. I did notice right. the disclaimers on most, right. most of your pages, but you've got a very complex stew of intellectual property from all sorts of sources here, and I just wondered, you know, how, 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 how that uh, orchestra was conducted there. Okay, so that's a very good question. Do I need to repeat the question about IP? And, okay, so I'll, ta I'll start with the disclaimers because that's the easy part. Um, about the time funding was just, you know, I didn't, we didn't know it was going to go away. But about that time, 
I was poised to fully disclose NUA to Cornell University. And when we no longer had funding, I had a lot more to do than that. But what we did get done with Cornell Legal is we got the disclaimers written. So the disclaimer on the website in total will talk about things like accuracy of the data, uh, et cetera. The disclaimers on each individual tool will talk about this is a tool and only a tool and it is not a substitute for actual field observations, etc. Um, in terms of intellectual property right, we have based all of the models that I know of at this point on published literature. Therefore, I don't think there would be an intellectual property right issue. There are developers who develop things beyond NUA. Bill Fry, case in point, the late life decision support system, which now is called White Grove. Um, another potential would be the DMCAST model, where um, you know some company might come along and say to the, the person who's primarily responsible for that research, hey, I'd like to develop an app for that. Uh, and that would be done. I have, um, at this point, not fully disclosed NUA. What I have done is all the references for these models are posted online. So the key one or two references for every model that we have in NUA is there online in its own place. It's not actually with the model. So maybe in the future we need to be with the model. So I haven't done that and hope that I won't have to. So Julie, thank you very much for a really interesting seminar. Let's thank the group one more time. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.